Shock the System. Welcome to Dank Discussions with me, Calican CEO Maynard Breslow. In each episode, you'll learn from the trailblazers, leaders, entrepreneurs, and influencers in the ever moving, ever growing cannabis industry. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Dank Discussions. Today, we're joined by the uncanny Alex Corrin. Alex is the CEO and founder of Uncanny Wellness, a water-soluble CBD company specializing in simple, versatile, and effective solutions for the specialty coffee industry. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Mater. Good to be here. Yeah, happy to have you. So uh, let, us, let us know where you're located today and where your company's based out of. Yeah, so we're uh, based out of Boulder, Colorado, but uh, it's currently two days before Christmas, so I'm in Florida with the family right now. Very cool, very cool. Got to do the, uh, you know, I was telling you off, it reminds me of uh, Home Alone 2, you know, and they go from <laughs> Chicago down to Florida. So uh, That's like right. Gonna, hopefully like, nothing too sketchy out. happens while I'm down here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, you know, hopefully you don't have to create a whole plan to, to bring all the, uh, bring down Joe Pesci and David Stern. You know? No, I'll, I'll be creating a plan to bring uh, CBD to the people. That's it, baby. That's it. So, so very cool. So, I mean, you talk about Colour, Boulder, Colorado, but I know that you're originally, you know, uh, you know, you say you're from New Jersey, you told me off air, and, um, you know, you got a degree in environmental science from the University of Vermont. So, you know, what took you out to, to Boulder, I guess? What, what is the main thing? Because you're in, you're in hemp. So, you know, yeah. Boulder's kind of known as the, you know, more THC, that side of cannabis, and um, you're doing a whole, you know, doing CBD. Yeah, so it, it was a bit of a winding road to how I ended up in Boulder. But, you know, starting back with that environmental science degree I got, I went to University of Vermont. And even back then, I was interested in the cannabis plant in general. And so, you know, back in, in my studies, I was first and foremost fascinated by the ability of the hemp plant to heal our environment. You know, like if you forget about the cannabinoids, forget about the hemp seed and all of that, just purely from a biological, uh, soil biology perspective and, you know, healing heavy metal toxicity and radiation and things like that. It's, it's an incredible powerhouse of a plant. So that already had piqued my interest. And then I kind of pursued uh, for a few years, traveling around to different places. The question generally of like, how do we live more in harmony with the planet? You know, people are eating foods that make them sick. Uh, people are, you know, just doing things that, um, or end up hurting them in the long run. And it always kind of pointed towards this cannabis plant as being a huge part of the healing of uh, the people on the planet. So that led me then to, uh, in 2015, going out for a full year in California on a marijuana farm. Oh. And we did the, the full thing, uh, 99 beautiful outdoor organic plants. I like to say it was the very much the literal and proverbial mountaintop Amazing. Of, of, uh, of weed. Yeah. And so we're, we're in California. You know, that was up in, um, in Lake County. So kind of like two hours North of the Bay area. Sweet. Sweet. And, um, yeah, you know, so like growing up as somebody who's always loved this plant and then being up there on a beautiful property with, you know, plants taller than myself and buds the size of my forearm, it was very much, um, it allowed me to ask the question, like what's next? Uh -huh. you know, clearly, this powerful plant is emerging. It's becoming legal for the first time like this ever. And it just so happens to be lining up with my professional career as I'm looking to sink my teeth into a deeper project and deeper purpose. And so while I was out there, as great as it was to be on the THC side of the space, I knew that for my professional career, I kind of wanted to bring and focus more on the health aspects, uh -huh. not necessarily about the getting high. It seemed uh -huh. like there was plenty of that. That was like the main focus of so many people, the THC side of things. So you can imagine, I mean, even back in 2015, the CBD thing was a lot smaller. It was really just coming on to people's uh, awareness. I remember there was like a National Geographic center spread about Charlotte's Web. And uh -huh. that was, in my mind, one of the first things that, broke it out into public awareness as being this really powerful option where you can get so many of the same benefits, but not get stoned. And so 
uh, the winter of 2015 into early 2016, I basically uh, retreated to a buddy's house in, uh, in Kauai. Uh, I wasn't ready to move to Colorado in the middle of the winter. So I went and helped him on his uh, permaculture farm and just brainstormed and did research on starting this business and what it might be like. And um, very much moved to Colorado because even though they already had this blossoming THC industry, it was the epicenter of all things hemp as well. And that's because back then, 2016, Colorado was, I believe, the only state that said, we're just going to go ahead and come out with our entire, an entire set of hemp cultivation regulations that allows farmers to grow it, allows this industry to emerge, because the rest of the country had been stuck in this like middle space from the 20, 2016 farm bill which allowed for hemp cultivation, but only in a very narrow window of circumstances. So Colorado was definitely the leader in hemp production as well, and especially Boulder is very much like a natural products capital of the world. So between the hemp, between Boulder being natural products, and between me just knowing some people out in Colorado already, it was uh, very clear that's where I had to be. Right, and uh, you know, your background, you know, did it come from what you jumped into, you know, just like you talked about, you know, you piqued your interest in environmental sciences and that that was like, wow, this plant's incredible. Now, you know, have you been using cannabis before or is that just kind of like, you know, an intellectual thing that you're like, this is great and I want to jump into this or, you know, uh, your background, your personal background, I guess a little bit. Yeah, I started using cannabis um, in high school uh -huh. and have always been a fan. You know, it always just really vibed with me. I always preferred it over alcohol um, and just got a lot of personal value from it, just from the introspective qualities and the growth that can come, you know, from being in a controlled alt altered state like that. And so, you know, at the same time, then I've always been very interested in the sciences and been very uh, much in pursuit of seeking the truth. And um, like my mom has always said, I've had like save the world syndrome. <laughs> so I've really been trying to hone in on, on really how to, you know, pull ourselves out of this mess that we're seemingly in, in so many regards. And so, um, you know, with this, the, the mind for science that has really helped as I've come into this industry because I think so many people enter this space now just because either they're passionate about the plant as a personal user, um, so they're maybe like a business-minded stoner, or they're uh, um, just really interested in the profits and don't know much about the science, and they try to make uh, understand as they go, which is good, of course. But for me, coming from a more technical background, I think has really helped because now, um, as I you know have conversations like this, or if I'm giving a presentation at a trade show, or just talking to new customers, I'm able to to refine these more complicated scientific understandings into ways that normal people can 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 get and digest. And I think that's so important because then that means that that person actually knows what's going on and they don't need to trust me. They can just understand for themselves and then make the best decisions because they got the right information. And save the world syndrome. I guess there, you know, there's worse <laughs> things to have than that, you know? So I, it's cool that you, you identify, first of all, you have a passion, you identified some, you know, something that piqued your interest that you wanted to deep dive into that you knew had benefit to, to people and to environment. And now you, you've done it. Um, and you're doing it as we speak. So, um, you know, talk about, you know, entrepreneurship, talking about, you know, having your own business. Why was that like the way to go about it as opposed to, you know, having someone, you know, being in someone else's business, using your brain, you know, to, to help mm -hmm. someone else's vision up. What was it about that you're like, you know what, like, I got to have my own thing and this is what I'm looking for and, and going for that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've, I have just kind of always felt the drive to start my own business, you know, just always been thinking of ideas and had that entrepreneurial uh, desire inside of me. But it very much took a lot of trial and error working for other people. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, when I was out on the, the farm in California, that was very much somebody else's property. You know, somebody else was the lead grower and I was there just learning and absorbing and trying to be as helpful as possible. And uh, then 
when I did move, first move to Colorado, I was doing research and my intention was to start my own business, but my first job was in a hemp extraction facility. So again, there I was able to go from bales of raw hemp material through the supercritical CO2 extractor and take that unrefined oil, put it through the rest of the laboratory processing, and then make thousands of tincture bottles and vape solution for people to walk away with. So I definitely, you know, spend my time working for other people, um, you know, in uh, just absorbing as much information as I could. And that was super important for me to refine my vision for what I wanted to do. Oh. Because it's, you know, you could have your own ideas, but it's really helpful to be in the world, especially when I was in that extraction lab, I was in the thick of it. You know, I was in a really high production lab right outside of Denver and was selling to this material to other people, um, working in the lab with one other person doing, doing the whole process. And so not only did that further my understanding of really what was going on, but I'd see who was coming in to buy this oil from us. What were they making? you know, talking to those people and furthering my own um, knowledge about all of this. So when it was time for me to start my own thing, I had all of that input and all of that feedback and understanding that really helped to refine the vision. And it has um, definitely continued to be refined over the years since starting the company. It looks a lot different today than it did uh, back in mid-2016 when I started. I had so important mentorship, you know, like you said, learning from people who are doing it already. Uh, it's so important. And, you know, that, that kind of mirrors my, my journey as well. And I'm passionate about entrepreneurship and that's why, you know, I appreciate having, you know, people like you on, uh, you know, cause that's really what drives me so much and obviously the industry. So combining my two passions together, um, you know, yeah. um, you know, and something that you also seem so passionate about is, you know, education, learning, you know, it seems like since, since the top of this conversation, it's been about, you know, being in school and going and, you know, working in California so you can learn more and going and working for other people in businesses. And, you know, it, I was really blown away, you know, because, um, you know, you talk about education and I, I learned from you already um, just very organically from your, from your YouTube channel, you know, Uncanny Wellness. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really, you know, I was really blown away by your deep knowledge of everything, um, you know, and um, Thank you. Can, you, can you give me like a, you know, t talk to me about what's the inspiration between behind the YouTube channel, where that start about. And I mean, the, aside from your content in terms of, you know, your knowledge and, you know, going down even, uh, you know, the history of hemp and, you know, where, where it was 10,000 years ago to where it was 1937, to where it is now, and you know, all it, this whole incredible journey. Um, yeah. You know, but not only that, but like the production value is really good too. You know, I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And so, so tell me what, what was the point of, what is the point of the YouTube channel? And uh, yeah. give me the story behind that. Totally, yeah. So I'm, I'm really glad that you found those videos helpful and that uh, they're making it out there. But basically, my inspiration for starting the YouTube channel came from a few places. Uh, for one, YouTube, for me personally, has been an incredibly valuable resource for learning. Um, I haven't really had cable TV for a long time now. And so my entertainment has come largely from YouTube creators. No streaming? You don't have any? No, no nothing? Uh, yeah, I've, I've been a, a stream a bit, but really YouTube <laughs> is my main platform for, uh, for, for content when I, um, when I want to sit down and watch something. And, and you know, it, it's the second most searched website on the internet after Google. And so there's just so much information on there. And I think especially if you're a visual learner, that it really helps to be able to see something as you're hearing it. And so beyond just my personal benefit that I've gotten from that platform, um, you know, I, people like Gary Vee, you know, the guru in marketing tactics, talking about valuable content, you know, just really drilling that in. And so in my head, I knew for, for Uncanny Wellness, I wanted to really, really create valuable content because I'd see some other brands, the CBD industry and beyond that, we're putting out content that just felt empty. You know, it's more just a post for the sake of posting. And I really wanted something that would stand out where people could watch it and then 
after the video ends, they really genuinely have learned something. Um, it's in a sense, it was like giving back for everything that I've gotten from the platform. And at the same time, you know, with the, with the CBD industry, same thing with the THC side, there's such a unique restrictions for marketing and advertising and for putting content out there. So the traditional avenues of, you know, create a post, pay money to Facebook to boost it and get in front of thousands of people doesn't really apply for this industry right now. Maybe if you're doing topicals, but that's another story. Um, and so for me, I kind of concluded that really video content is the most valuable and it is evergreen in the sense that if you make a post on say Facebook or Instagram, it's pretty much buried in a few hours, uh -huh. but on YouTube, it seems to grow and blossom with time. Uh -huh. So that's a very big difference. So if, if I'm putting in the hours to create a piece of content, I want it to over time get more awareness versus it just get buried in three days. And then um, on top of that, you know, just because I started this company myself, um, you know, without external funding really, and pretty much have been taking it slow and very organically, I knew that I wouldn't have the marketing budget to compete with a bigger brand. But one thing I could do is out authentic them. Yeah. You know, I could be the CEO standing up in front of the camera telling the people how it is where they might have a whole marketing team and, and a lot more going on and like a lot more filter mechanisms to get the message out where I could just stand right in front and be like, Hey, here's what's going on. And it, you know, for me, just educating people to further understand themselves, it's true empowerment, empowerment. You know, if, if they can know what's going on, if they can understand how we got to this point with the hemp plant, if they can understand the difference between hemp CBD and marijuana CBD, then they can go out and help others further understand it. Because all of us that are passionate about this plant have work to do for reversing the stigma. Because it's, you know, it's not a neutral place we're coming from. We're coming from global prohibition for the past 80 years. We're, we're coming from people thinking that it's a terrible drug that's going to turn you into an addict. It's we're not? We're coming from a place, <laughs> <laughs> hasn't happened to me yet, yeah. but you know, coming from this, this place where really if people know the truth and if people can then move forward in their own life with the right knowledge, it's just better for everybody. They can make the right decisions for themselves and they can help others make the right decision. Wow, I love that. I really love that. I mean, I, once again, strikes a chord with me. Um, you know, I found you organically. I had to track you down. I was like, I want Alex on the, on the podcast, you know, and that's the same thing here. That's the same idea here behind the podcast is I'm passionate about this, get to meet cool people, get to hear their story, get to learn from them and then get to transmit that out there and to teach people, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the ins and outs, what's going on uh, and kind of do deep dives that you maybe you wouldn't necessarily be able to do, um, you know, even with the blog posts or, or with other things, because, you know, we're having a conversation back and forth. And like I said, I really enjoy your content. So keep it up, man. Thank you. Um, Thanks. That's, that's, I will. Definitely. Now, you know, some of the things that, you know, talking about education, um, something that a lot of people aren't educated on. I think we talk about, you know, CBD and we talk a lot about oil-based formulations. We talk about, mm -hmm. you know, obviously tinctures and, and, you know, all the way down. I think a lot of the, we're manufactured a lot with, with oil-based formulations, everything um, that we're using mostly. Um, but you're into water-soluble CBD. So, I would really love to learn a lot more about this. So, you know, kind of take me in talking about deep dive. Let's do this deep dive yeah. here, you know, between water soluble CBD and oil based formulations and um, give me, give me everything. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I'll, I'll go back to the lab I was working in when I first moved to Colorado in or, uh, early 2016, I was in that extraction facility. And of course, all of that was, it was the oils. It was the full process, you know, refining that raw oil into more of the extract that people are familiar with. And all the while when I was doing my research then, I had just, you know, come across this idea, this concept of water soluble CBD, which obviously it sounds uh, counterintuitive because CBD traditionally is a very sticky, very oily oil. Um, and so the more I looked into this whole water soluble idea, the more I learned about actually how important it was. 
And the general uh, purpose of it is that oil, uh, CBD oil, and it, it faces a problem that like 40% of new drug compound space, which is that it is oil soluble and its ability to be properly absorbed in the body through the stomach directly relates to its ability to dissolve in water. And so that's just like a whole class of drug compounds out there. I think uh, it's class two in pharmacokinetics, but those drug compounds can only be absorbed by the body in the stomach as much as they can be dissolved in water. And so that then, then when, you, when you take a step back and you think of all the products that are out there for CBD, the vast, vast majority, like probably 95% are oil-based formulations. And there's a good reason for that. Um, the natural extract of the plant is oil. And so when you refine that out and you have it in its you know, purest form in a sense, it, that it, it's very much an oil. And so you can look at the whole CBD industry and how the product evolution has rolled out where, you know, say in 2015, 2016, people were literally selling just syringes filled with oil. And, and, you know, people would then go and hold it under their tongue and it tasted terrible. It was hard to dose. It was sticky, but people didn't care because of how profound the results were that they were getting. And then you go a step forward from there and you have, you know, that base oil, but instead of just in a syringe, it's maybe cut with the carrier oil, like MCT, uh, coconut, olive, hemp seed oil, maybe mixed with a little bit of flavor like vanilla or, or cinnamon. And then that oil became your tinctures. And then, so that is pretty much what every tincture on the market is today. It's that simple base CBD oil mixed with a carrier oil and maybe some flavor. So it's a little more palatable, a little uh, easier to dose. And then beyond that, I mean, you have your, your creams and your salves, and those are the same thing. It's that base oil mixed with carrier oil, you know, maybe different types, maybe some different herbals in there to help uh, promote healing on the skin. And then again, the, the vapes, that's also just mixed with other oil-based carriers. So those, it's a very narrow window of application. So all of those, that's either into the lungs, you know, vaping or smoking, it's through the skin, or it's under the tongue with tinctures. But if you go into any natural food store, um, you know, our supplement department, what you see mostly on the shelf is pills and powders, both of which just go into your stomach. Uh -huh. So it hit me from the beginning that if CBD is truly going to go mainstream and it's going to really be something that people adopt into their everyday life, it's going to have to be in a pill or powder form and generally just some format that when delivered to the body and just swallowed, you're actually going to be getting the full dose. And, um, you know, the absorption rates for CBD oil, say you were to just swallow a tincture without holding it under your tongue, could be as low as 10 or 20%. So pretty, pretty terrible. Um, and water soluble is kind of like the placeholder term. It's like the functional result of what happens. But really what, what's happening is a, a, a conversion. Um, more or less the particle size is being broken down. So if you picture like CBD oil, where all the CBD molecules and all the stuff inside are like a big blob. Uh -huh. Water soluble formulations turn that big blob into like a sub micron size droplet so that you can swallow it and it can enter your bloodstream and enter your system more effectively, you know, with full absorption rates compared to getting processed by your body before you can absorb it. So, so once I really understood that, it became just so clear to me that for one, not only standing out as a brand with a different product offering, water soluble was a great way to go, but also if people want to put it in their coffee, if people want to put it in their smoothie, you know, after a workout, their tea before bed, or even if they just want to swallow a capsule to get the full dose they're expecting and the results they want to achieve, it needs to be in this converted format. Wow. That's, that's so fascinating. I mean, yeah, I think already, I mean, it's such a, obviously, um, industry so young, so we still have a long way to go. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, like you said, going to other shops to, to, you know, other supplements or other health wellness products, you know, we look at definitely looking at powders, 
Um, and I know obviously, you know, CBD is good for recovery for, for, you know, after the workout, after gym, there's so many value of having in different forms. Um, like you said, I'm having coffee right now. So pretty soon I'm going to have some uncanny. Um, yeah, there you go. Uncanny there. And, and the thing is too, you know, with like, you know, when it comes down to it, you want people to be incorporating this into their routines and into their life uh, in the easiest way possible. And to do that, you really got to reduce the friction between the product and the customer. And so the early adopters that were just stoked on the cannabis plant and really excited about taking CBD, they didn't really care maybe about holding a tincture under their tongue. And I know, you know, personally, I'm more into the natural products, herbal side of things. So I don't mind it either. Uh, but for people to like the, the general public, the mainstream audience, they're not going to hold a gross tasting tincture under their tongue. That's not part of the things that they do. You know, they're going to shake something up in their water bottle. They're going to put something in their coffee. They're just going to swallow a pill. And so it's really like the more approachable and sensible way in my mind for people to be taking CBD. Wow. I mean, that's, that's, a, you know, it's a brand new thing for me, definitely because, you know, like you're talking about the efficacy of it, you know, the absorption of it. That's, that's one thing. And I think we talk a lot about, um, you know, the stigma associated with, you know, cannabis in general and adoption in general. Um, but that's such a great point where people, like you said, in their day-to-day -day life, they're not just sticking stuff under their tongue, um, you know, and holding it there. Um, they're just not a way that people are, are using anything. So um, mm. definitely. So, you know, my question is, you know, do you think it's, it's kind of product um, based meaning that certain, you know, oil versus the water soluble um, would be better for one product versus another? Or do you think that water soluble is just like the future? Like take us 20 years down the road and it's just going to, like you said, people have pills and everything out there, um, you know, from, from the pills to the bath bombs or everything in between is going to be like water soluble um, or there's still value to the oils. So, yeah, that's a great question. Really the, the right, form of CBD to use so largely depends on the way that that person wants to deliver it to their body. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for example, if somebody is like, yeah, my elbow is super sore and I really want to use a topical product and get CBD absorbed in my skin, then yeah, having an oil based, you know, uh, cream, that's fine. You know, that you don't need water soluble necessarily because the water soluble thing is very specific for overcoming the absorption obstacle in the stomach. Uh -huh. It's this thing called the first pass effect or first pass metabolism, which is not unique to cannabis extracts. It's something that a lot of drug compounds are up against when they have to be absorbed in the stomach. So like a lot of mainstream cholesterol and heart medications also go through this similar conversion processes to overcome that first pass effect. And so, you know, if, or if somebody's into vaping and that's what they want to do, then they don't need to use a water soluble, the oil soluble vape in solution into the lungs, that is going to work fine. But I think for most people, and if we're going 20 years forward here, what makes the most sense is that it's going to be a lot of, you know, your capsules and pills basically something that could be part of an individual supplement routine so for that example yes it would have to be water soluble or some form of cbd converted for absorption in the stomach and then i think what's going to be really big is infused products you know we're already starting to see that um that's kind of my niche is allowing like cafes and other people at home users to infuse whatever they're already doing um but you know, we're seeing the chocolates, seltzers, you know, CBD infused, everything. It's a little bit too much right now. I think it'll, it'll all kind of settle out. Some things will make sense to be infused and some things will be like, oh, that was ridiculous. I can't believe we did that. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's in my mind, just like eating or drinking something or just taking a pill. That's going to be the way that most people approach this substance. And um, yeah, for, for, for it to be like that, then water soluble is definitely going to be the, the move. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you said it, it's so funny. I was laughing because it's just like everything. It's just a buzzword, right? It's like CBD, CBD, CBD in this, CBD in that. You know, so I think, like you said, later on down the road, we'll say, well, that was kind of silly. But, uh, yeah, like I just had a, 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 somebody 
that I'm potentially working with, uh, they're interested in, I, I, I sell bulk material, you know, I have my uncanny wellness branded products, but some people also reach out that are doing their own brands and they basically want like a kilo of material to infuse into their own products. Um, and so this guy happens to be making condiments. And uh, so he sent me some samples and it was like a CBD infused barbecue sauce and ketchup and mustard. And they were like super artisanal and tasted great. And I hope it works out for him, but I feel like that's the type of thing where we'll look back and be like, yeah, CBD infused ketchup probably just doesn't make the most sense. Uh, you know, but it, it's, it's just part of where we're at in the industry. It's so young and we still need to mature so much into it. Um, and that's really why I try leaning on education because it's so easy to get caught up in the buzz and the hype and it almost feels spammy sometimes because it's seen everywhere and uh, there's a lot of sensational headlines and, um, you know, in, in the news. So really just stripping that all away, getting to the kernels of truth and figuring out what really makes sense is what it's all about. That's so funny. That's so funny. I mean, I, you know, hey, I hate to say it, but I'm a condiment guy. I love ketchup. There was <laughs> CBD ketchup. Obviously, there may be better ways to take it, but uh, he pro that's not a bad marketing technique, you know? So No, totally. And hey, I could totally be wrong. Like maybe it'll, we'll have a future where CBD is kind of just like slipped into everything. And you don't even have to think about dosing because you know that you're just passively getting CBD throughout your day. It's like, oh, it's in my morning coffee, and then it's in the ketchup on my veggie burger, and then it's in my uh, pasta sauce for dinner later. Oh. But I, I think it's going to make a lot more sense for, you know, it, it's so important to know what the dose is and to be able yeah. to accurately exactly. dose. And so, like, because, you know, for one person, 10 milligram dose in the morning could be perfect. That's what they need for somebody else. They might be taking 40 milligrams twice a day. And um, uh, I guess, yeah, for me, sometimes with the infused products and the really creative stuff, it's hard to figure out exactly what you're doing, but maybe that's not the point for those types of products. So, you know, there could be room for both. No, uh, that's, that's, that's the whole point. That really is the whole point is knowing what you're putting in your body. And I mean, I think we talk about CBD and you're, you're uncanny wellness and i think the whole point is, is is wellness and it's about having you know a full pronged approach to wellness you know knowing what you're putting in your body and being conscious and aware um and i think that that i think in the long run is and i think that's kind of the appeal for for a lot of people um you know not just with this but with, with other things um you know in terms of you know like you said vegan you know veggie burger you know people vegan whatever it is that we're putting in our body people are a lot more aware about it um, and I think that's really the key in knowing. Yeah. And, and wellness is a very, uh, yeah, well, it, it's a pretty big picture, you know, with wellness. And uh -huh. I think, you know, it keeps coming back to education, but part of what I think my message is, is that, Hey, this isn't a silver bullet for all your problems. Yeah. That's not how it's going to work. You know, it's uh -huh. not like you're going to just, you know, take one CBD capsule and your life is going to change. All your worries are going to go away and you're going to heal your relationship with your mother and, uh, you know, like it's, it's, it's just not the truth. Um, it can significantly help people. It can produce profound effects. And especially if, if your body needs it and you're in, and you're cannabinoid deficient, you know, it can, it could change things practically overnight for you, but it's also like, you should probably be eating healthy. You know, you should be exercising. You should be doing these other things to take care of yourself. You can't just ex expect this one compound to get rid of all your troubles so you know it's definitely the holistic approach and the deeper understanding is is what i always try to convey to people so that they can really help themselves yeah i mean that if you know that's what this is all about and um you know i, I bring that up sometimes when people you know are kind of gung-ho about it on the on the podcast um and kind of challenge them a little bit on it because i think yeah uh, ultimately it is about um you know it comes up all the time, you know, where we live in a society that just kind of wants, just give me, give me an app to solve my problems. You know, if we could really, yeah. we can have an app that could be, you know, help our relationships, um, you know, that would do work for us, everything like that, we would do it. If there was a pill that could do that and we just kind of want, you know, instant gratification, like, I don't want to put in work, man. Like I'm yeah. tired of, I don't want to, why would, why would I need to put in work to lower my blood pressure? Just give me some literature, man. What's the problem? You know, it's like all, all these different things that are going on. Um, and I think that that's the main, that's the main point that we take home a lot is that this, it's, it's a, it's an amazing, amazing 
uh, you know, time that we're living in now that we have this, at, at, you know, in our access, you know, we're gaining more, we're learning more, um, there's more research being done, but it's not going to solve your problems. It's really not, it's going to help you, um, you know, and, and, you know, but there, there are certain things that, you know, like I said, you know, epilepsy, autism, um, you know, all kinds of different things that people are getting so much relief from. And that's amazing. I think just from day to day, um, you know, I think we have to hold back a little bit on what we, yeah. From. Yeah. It, it reminds me of, uh, this, uh, a quote, it's, uh, something like, you know, the, the, the fastest way to become an overnight success is 10 years of really hard work. Yeah, yeah. And so it takes 10 it's years like of the, being overnight you know, success. Exactly. Yeah. So like the, the fastest way to become the healthiest, you know, uh, most balanced version of yourself is just putting in the work day after day and being consistent and, and just being holistic in your approach to health and wellness. Definitely. There's no shortcut. There's no shortcut in anything. That's for sure. You know, in your business, you know, in, in our, in our health and in, in everything that we're doing. So we have to, uh, we're kind of inoculated with it. We're kind of trained to think that way. So we, I think uh, we're going to have to take a step back from that a little bit. I want to get into your, you know, your business a little bit deeper too. Um, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are really, tech based, um, you know, really, you know, you're talking about leaning heavily on tech technology and automation and AI. Um, and to me, that was super interesting. Um, now, can you tell me what that means? Um, you know, in terms of, you know, you, you picture this, you know, huge hemp farm and, you know, this big factory and, um, you know, this, this facility that's doing the manufacturing and, you know, kind of, kind of what are you guys doing there with uncanny? Yeah. So, you know, because I, I have the experience, you know, with my hands in the dirt, growing the plants and harvesting them and curing the buds and all of that. And then I had my, you know, hands on experience in the laboratory, extracting the hemp material, refining the oil, turning it into final products. I really got a chance to see so many different parts of the chain uh, from firsthand experience. And so then when it came time for me to start Uncanny Wellness, I was very much doing it um, alone. You know, I was looking for co-founders for a while, but I just saw this window of opportunity, this time to jump in. And I knew that it was never going to be perfect timing. And I just had to go for it. And so for the first really two and a half years of the business, I was completely solopreneuring it myself. And, you know, I, I didn't have a big budget to start with but I did have a deep understanding of the industry and how it worked. And I had been making connections over the years. And so on top of that, we live in this golden age of possibility for digital operations and infrastructure where pretty much you could be anywhere in the world and you could have a business in one way or another. There's obviously some extra challenges when it comes to something like CBD, where it's such a physical product. But basically the way I set it up was that, you know, I found a key laboratory partner back in 2016 who I still work with today. And we have an awesome relationship. Like we're total homies and we've got each other's back, but he's the one now that does the extraction and has the equipment, not me. I'm no longer in the lab myself. Um, and then, you know, as far as making product goes, I have, you know, for, really up until recently for some, sometimes I would go into a commercial kitchen space and do production runs myself, but that was more from the, you know, going into the final packaging form. Other than that, I outsourced that to people with professional facilities that, you know, already had the machines and I just could then send them everything I needed for them to put it together. And so, you know, I've just been in the mentality of not needing to necessarily reinvent the wheel you know, there's already people with the extractors. There's already people with the lines that can fill the capsules. Um, there's already companies that are set up to plug into my e-commerce store where I could send them all my product. And if somebody places an order, then it automatically ships out. So all of these things I've been building up over the past few years as I've needed to. Like, for example, with the shipping and fulfillment of orders, there was a point where I was just running to <laughs> FedEx every day and, you know, whether it was, you know, one or two orders or 10 orders, it was just taking up a lot of my time between the packing and then the sending and then the uploading the tracking information. And I could have 
um, you know, hired somebody probably to just pack orders for me. But that almost felt like more of a Band-Aid. And I wanted a solution that could scale. And so I found a company on, that plugs into my website. And I now just send them my product in bulk. And so they're like my fulfillment warehouse. And if an order comes in, it automatically ships out right to them. And so now the beauty of that is not only does it free up a lot of my time, but I could scale up. I could be doing hundreds uh-huh. of orders per day and nothing has to change. Uh-huh. And same thing with my uh, like laboratory partner, like the amount of product I'm making now, I can make 10 times as much and he has the machines to handle it. And my co-packer, um, you know, like if, if I need to make 500 of one unit or 5,000 of a unit, they got it. They can take care of it. So it's, it was building this all to scale where if I tried to just do it internally, say I like, you know, raised some money and got my own commercial kitchen space or got my own lab equipment. It's like at every point of growth from there, you need another machine. You need to hire more people. But right now I could be sitting on my computer and I could be sending emails or jumping on a phone call and taking care of everything. And, um, so I, I recently took that approach also for, uh, for, for sales. Um, cause as I basically 2019 for me was a really big year for reaching out to coffee shops. Uh, at the end of 2018, we kind of pivoted into this niche, really dialed in our focus and we grew from four cafes to 130 cafes where our product is sold basically as an add on to anything on their menu. And I was able to do that through actually this, um, AI, Uh, algorithm that I worked with this company to create where they basically um, it it searches the internet based on a certain criteria. And then I I get a list of leads, which looks like, um, you know, email addresses of different cafes in different areas. And then I send them an email, basically introducing myself and the brand. And if they're interested, then I send them a sample and we take it from there. But that again, allowed me to not spend hours on the computer, searching through the internet, looking for email addresses, testing to see if the email address was valid or if it was gonna bounce. Instead, it's just more of this passive thing now. It's this system that feeds me leads and then I pick up the live conversation when people are interested in product. Wow, I mean, there's so much there and that that is packed with value really because, you know, you know, we get amazing feedback from this podcast. I'm grateful for that. And we have a lot of listeners who have successful businesses who listen to the podcast to, to hear the different people in the industry and to learn something new and to really deep dive and learn something that's more nuanced than what, they're, uh, than what they have, their, their awareness or their education at the moment. And there's a lot of people as well who are um, looking to get into the industry or people who, who – wanting to learn more who may not know that much or people who want to own a business, um, you know, people who may not have that big brand already. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm grateful we run the whole gamut. Now that right there is the most valuable information that you can learn. If you want to open a business, if you want to have your own business, you know, I think we kind of um, romanticize, you know, with this entrepreneurship thing that like in order to be an entrepreneur, you have to run yourself ragged. You have to like, right. you know, you have to do everything and you have to wear all these different hats and you have to be on top of this and that and this whole control thing or, you know, it, it, you get into it and it's kind of the way that we're kind of meant to think about it a lot. But if you look, it's, it's the complete opposite. You know, successful yeah. business people don't do that. They don't. What they do is they delegate. They find people who are doing things and they get them on board to do it with them. And, you know, they, they find systems and that's the whole thing is to create systems. You know, I find a lot of people who they, they have the best intentions, entrepreneurs are like, Oh, I can learn how to do that. I can learn how to do that. And of course, when funding's tight, you know, you kind of got to, you know, bootstrap and and do it the best that you can. There's something to that, but it gets to a point where you got to, you know, scale, like you said, you can't scale if you're fulfilling every single order yourself, if you're doing everything, if you're on the phone doing all the sales, if you're reaching out to everybody, you don't have it set up properly. So I really think that there's so much value into that for anybody who's listening right now, you know, just, you know, that take it from us and from other people as well, who are way more successful than I am. That's for sure. Um, yeah. There's a great, uh, there's a great saying that has always really resonated with me that is basically you, you can only fall as far as your systems. Uh-huh. If you, if you have these systems in place, 
then, you know, it, it's kind of like this foundational place from which you can operate from. And so for anybody that, you know, is, that does want to get into this space, you know, you are going to wear many hats and it's important to, to know enough about enough things to get yeah. it all off the ground. Uh -huh. But then as you go forward, you got to recognize where your weaknesses are. So like my one employee, he is my CFO. Cause for me, the numbers and the pro formas and the projection, that's my weakest point. You know, I'm more of the science vision dude. Um, but, and so he was the one I hired cause I knew that was my, the biggest hole in my thinking. And then same thing for these operations. It's like, I was doing okay myself or could get by, but I gave it to the experts. And so that's, you know, my strategy too going into 2020. And for anybody, I think in any line of business, it's you got to bring people in and work with people who are better than you in that thing. Uh -huh. Definitely. And, you know, I guess, you know, with all these different experiences you've had, you know, scaling now for the last four or five years um, and growing it from the ground up and solopreneuring it and, now having systems, what has been your big, biggest obstacle that you face and how are you able to overcome it? I think the biggest obstacle um, has just been some of these industry specific hurdles that are here. Um, you know, where say I just had a, uh, a brand of socks or something very neutral. You know, I could be using all of these traditional marketing avenues. I could be, you know, working with targeted Facebook advertising, social media, and these, you know, boosting posts on different platforms. And, you know, it, so there's been just this very much Wild West mentality around it all. Like, for example, this year in 2019, um, we had our merchant processing pulled out from under us halfway through. Only, so, like, I mean, come be, on, CBD, dude. I mean, the cannabis industry as a whole, that's like, if that hasn't happened know, to you, then I don't know, you know. How, I mean, it, so it was the like second or third time it's happened to me. Yeah, this yeah. one was particularly annoying because, you know, you're trying to grow your business and you're trying to move things forward, but then all of a sudden you can't take payments. You're like, yeah. oh, all right, well, that's kind of a kink in the chain. And um, yeah, like that really hurt because um, we had a subscription program going, uh. you know, where people would just sign up for recurring orders on our website. They'd get like a permanent discount and it would be shipped every six, eight weeks, whatever they set. But that was really great because I was able to look in and say, OK, over the next six months, we're going to have forty thousand dollars of recurring revenue guaranteed because these people have signed up that ground to a halt. As soon as the payment processing shut down, uh. I lost all of that recurring revenue. And so it's these, these special, very unique little hurdles that have come up over the years. Um, and I just have to remind myself, and I think it's valuable for anybody thinking about being in this space, that it is very much pre-regulatory. You know, all of this is unprecedented and you got to kind of roll with the punches. You know, getting in now is still getting in early. Uh -huh. And so you're kind of signing up for a little bit of extra headache. And it's important to just have the right mindset that doesn't get under your skin and doesn't stress you out too much because you just got to almost anticipate that some extra BS is going to come along. You know, and there's always BS and that's the whole thing. You know, we don't live in, you don't work in the cannabis industry. It's the compliance industry. And, you know, and there's always something that's coming up and, you know, entrepreneurship and owning a business in and of itself is uh, obviously super hard. Um, and then in this industry, it's, there's so many added, um barriers obviously um things overcome hurdles so that's for sure now i know you have a lot of good stuff coming up you know so what can we expect from uncanny wellness uh in the future in 2020 in this, in this decade yeah so we are um we're super excited to be uh, launching a new product coming out hopefully february march uh it's kind of it's still coming together right now but it's something we've been working on for a while i think it's gonna be really good and also we have a rebrand coming out. So probably whoever's listening to this, if you go on our website, it'll already be turned over. But generally it's, um, you know, because we pivoted into serving the specialty coffee market and we're going to be expanding into other markets like that, uh, we tweaked the look of the brand to be a little sexier, if you will. Um, so it's kind of got a more mature vibe now and it's, it's um, going to be looking really good. So very happy about that. And then just, yeah, continued expansion out into the world of coffee. So if you're listening to this and you got a local cafe that's not serving CBD, definitely uh, 
tell them about Uncanny, tell me about them, and hopefully we can get it on the menu. I love it. I love it. Definitely. You know, and you talk about now kind of going from this kind of broad brand into a more focused brand. And we talk about that a lot as well. It's, or at least I do with my clients, you know, it's uh, how important it is to niche down and not be everything to everybody. And to really find, you know, what you're passionate about and what's working and how can we get, you know, double down on that. Definitely. Um, which is what's, what's going to separate us in the long run. Definitely. So, um, so cool, man, Alex, you know, uh, you know, I got to ask, you know, super smart guy, super knowledgeable, uh, always out to educate yourself and uh, have a lot of life experiences. Um, so, I, you know, I got to ask you just like I asked everybody else, but really interested to hear, you know, how you define success and what does success look like for you? It's a great question. Uh, I think I ask myself that a lot, but right now off the top of the head, I'd say that success means uh, having enough and feeling like you are enough and not the continual pursuit of feeling like you need more or need to become somebody else, but really sinking into who you are as a person and cultivating a life that you feel comfortable in and are surrounded by people that support you and you have your basic needs met. And that to me sounds like success. Yes. You know, you know, when you said having enough, you know, going into this like outer kind of thing, and then you said being enough, know that you are enough. And that's really what it boils down to because, you know, we live in this society now where it's just all about uh, what can I show? What can I, what can I, you know, put for the gram? Um, and, um, you know, how much am I worth? Yeah. Uh, net worth. No, it's uh, self worth. Uh, the having enough and the being enough, those are both mindsets. Yeah. It's, it's not an accumulation of things. It's, it's a, it's a way to be. hundred percent, you know, and uh, definitely, uh, you know, more successful people that I ask, the more that I see that the, that's the common thread with it. Um, either, you know, internal happiness, um, moving forward with that or being someone who's inherently a giver. So that's why I'm uh, always interested to hear what people say and I really appreciate that as well. So awesome, Alex. Uh, as we close, how can our fi- listeners find out more about Uncanny Wellness and connect with you? Yeah, so thank you. That was a, a great conversation. Um, people could look us up on YouTube, like how you originally found out about us, or they can go to our website, uncannywellness.com. And on pretty much all the social platforms, we're also just at Uncanny Wellness. And I encourage people to reach out with questions, um, you know, hit us up. Always open to continue helping the cause and bring this plant out to the people and helping uh, people figure out really how to relate to CBD and cannabis space in general. Great. Yeah, we'll, we'll link that in the descriptions as well. And um, so through the brand, rebranding, it's going to, everything will be stay the same uh, in terms of uncanny and everything. Um, the yeah. Yeah. All, all the uh, internal things will be staying the same kind of same products. Uh, it's just going to have a whole new look and feel to it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thanks again, Alex, for jumping on today. Really appreciate it. So good luck to you and the rest of 2020 and beyond. All right. Thank you too. Take care. Thank you. We at Calican are passionate about cannabis marketing, branding, and web design. If you're a cannabis entrepreneur and you know you need an uptake in business or an upgrade in the way your customers perceive you, come check us out at calican.com and schedule a time to speak with us. Plans start at $248. Thanks for listening in to Dank Discussions, and we are so grateful for each and every one of you. We want to continue making dank content you want, so give us some feedback about the topics you want covered. Feel free to reach out to us at grow at calacan.com. That's C-A-L-A-C-A-N-N.com. And follow us on Instagram for our latest updates.